Okay, so uh, so this is a, a, con a continuation of the previous lecture. So we have just seen that projective space is covered by n plus one copies of open sets, which are oh, which are isomorphic to affine n n dimensional space. Now, what I wanted to say is that uh, uh, from this, uh, uh, the first thing that uh, we should notice is that you know uh, if you take any projective variety, a projective variety is, is an irreducible closed subset of projective space then that projective variety if I intersect with, with ui I will get uh, a projective variety and take its image I will get a projective I will get an affine variety in a n okay and therefore from this you will get that any projective variety is a finite union of affine varieties okay so that is uh, so these are all corollaries of this uh, of this uh, con construction so these are all observations observations which are very important for us. Uh, number one, the, the projective space itself is a union of all the UIs, i equal to zero to n. Each UI isomorphic via phi i to a n. So you have this. Two, uh, if x is a subset of p n then x is a union of from i equal to 0 to n uh, x intersection uh, ui so any affine any any projective respectively quasi projective variety uh, is covered by finitely many uh, affine respectively quasi affine varieties okay and uh, the, the the most important thing is that any variety uh, as uh, therefore is a finite uh, union of uh, open subsets each isomorphic to an affine variety okay so <coughs> so for that uh, um, uh, if you take a, if you take a pn or if you take a projective variety it is very clear that the that by the first two remarks that it is certainly a finite union of uh, affine varieties. The only case that one has to cover is the case of quasi projective or quasi affine varieties okay. So uh, what I want to say is that if you take first of all I want to say that if you take a quasi affine variety that also can be covered by a finite union of uh, affine varieties okay. So <coughs> three. Uh, any quasi affine variety uh, is a finite union of affine varieties. Why is this so? Because you see, you you take y inside some A M. This is irreducible closed, which means that y is a closed sub variety of uh, affine space. So it's a y is a y is an affine variety, and then in that you take a u uh, non-empty open. Then this u will be a quasi-affine variety. By definition, a quasi-affine variety is a non-empty open subset of an affine variety. And now, now y is uh, Z of uh, uh, P, where uh, P is a prime ideal in the uh, uh, P P inside the affine coordinate ring of this affine variety A M prime ideal. 
so it is 0 set of a prime ideal because it is a variety okay it is an irreducible closed subset so it corresponds to a prime ideal it is 0 set of that prime ideal and uh, this of course uh, anyway this ideal is in this which is a polynomial ring in m variables and it is uh, by Hilbert's basis theorem it is uh, uh, it is Noetherian. Uh, so, uh, the prime ideal P is also finitely generated any ideal is finitely generated. So, you can write if you write P as the ideal generated by G1 through GL uh, by uh, the Hilbert basis theorem then you know that uh, mm, um, no this is not what I want sorry <coughs> it is no no this is not what I want. So, so I have uh, uh, so, u is an open subset here all right what I want is the following uh, I want to show that uh, this u which is a quasi affine variety is a finite union of affine varieties I want to show that and the way to do that is uh, to realize that the this the fact that why uh, that uh, that u is a uh, uh, so the complement of u inside y is a closed subset of uh, y all right uh, and it therefore corresponds to a uh, an ideal okay so y minus u is z of uh, j bar where uh, j uh, where j in uh, uh, a of a n is an ideal containing uh, containing p okay this is what will happen. So, you see uh, uh, I have I have this uh, quotient map uh, quotient homomorphism from this to the, the affine coordinating of affine space to the affine coordinating of the of the uh, the affine variety y and this is just given by mod p okay and uh, and what is a uh, what is y what is y minus u it is a closed subset of y okay and y is already a closed subset of am so it is a closed subset of am also a closed subset of a closed subset is also a closed subset therefore it is given by an ideal uh, in the uh, uh, in the am in the in the affine coordinating of the big big affine space and in fact uh, if you want to look at it it will be given by the 0 set so in fact maybe I should not put j bar I should simply put j okay just put j uh, it will be the 0 set uh, uh, it will be the 0 set of j and uh, uh, if you consider it as a 0 set in the uh, full affine space okay and uh, of course j will be an ideal uh, uh, which will contain p because zj is contained inside zp okay and uh, 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 now, uh, now J is generated by finitely many elements, so G1 through GL, okay. And what will happen is, uh, and this is of course because any ideal uh, is finitely generated because this is a, a Noetherian ring. This is a polynomial ring in M variables. That's a Noetherian ring by Hilbert basis theorem or M Noether's theorem. So this is finitely generated. Uh, so if you take these as generators. Then of course, uh, uh, if you take uh, if you take uh, the complement of uh, J in the full affine space, that will be a union of uh, the basic open sets given by all these GIs. Okay, so you know uh, AM K minus uh, ZJ uh, will be uh, union uh, DG I I equal to 1 to L okay and uh, therefore uh, if you take uh, 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 if you take y minus zj so y minus zj which is uh, which is u okay this will be am minus zj uh, intersected with uh, uh, y okay and so it will be uh, union i equal to 1 to l uh, dgi intersection y 
all right and therefore uh, but the point i want to make is that each each dgi uh, inside uh, am you know is an affine variety itself though it is an open subset of am it is isomorphic to uh, a, an irreducible closed subset of a affine space of what dimension 1 more by the Rabinovich trick. So this is so you know from am so you have you have am plus 1 uh, k and you take the 0 set of uh, uh, gi into uh, some extra variable uh, t minus 1 okay. So t m plus 1 if you want and and you know that uh, there is this uh, there is a there is an isomorphism varieties like this okay each each dgi uh, basic open set in a fine space is itself an affine variety okay which means it is isomorphic to an affine variety what is affine variety it is the affine variety given by g times uh, 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 gi times a new variable an extra variable minus 1 0 set of that in uh, in an affine variety of dimension 1 more we have seen this earlier. So now what I want you to understand is that you know uh, why uh, y uh, is a closed subset of am therefore y is also a closed subset y y intersection dgi is a closed subset of dgi okay y is a closed subset of am of the affine space so y intersection dgi is a closed subset of dgi for the induced topology therefore it will be and y intersection dgi uh, is also uh, irreducible that is because of the following fact dgi intersection y is a non empty open subset of y and y is irreducible therefore dgi intersection y is also irreducible. So the moral of the story is that dgi intersection y is an irreducible closed subset of dgi and via this isomorphism it will give you an irreducible closed subset of this and therefore it will become an affine variety. So I am just trying to say why each dgi intersection y is itself isomorphic to an affine variety okay and the finite union of all such is your u. So what this argument shows is that any quasi affine variety is a finite union of affine varieties and if you combine that uh, if I if you combine that with uh, with 1 and 2 okay you will get that any uh, even a quasi projective variety will also be uh, a finite union of affine varieties. So if you put everything together you will get that any variety is a finite union of affine varieties okay any variety has a finite cover by open subsets each of which is isomorphic to an affine variety. And thus we say that affine varieties are the building blocks of varieties okay. So let me write that down here that is very important. Thus, uh, uh, DGI intersection Y is a closed subset of DGI. Uh, DGI intersection Y is an open subset. as long as it is non empty uh, it is an open subset and as long as it is non empty is irreducible thus dgi intersection y is itself and uh, a fine variety <coughs> okay 
because it is a irreducible closed subset of an affine variety uh, or something that is isomorphic to an affine variety. Thus uh, u is a finite union of open affine uh, finite union of open subsets each isomorphic to an affine variety. So this is point number this is observation 3 that any quasi affine variety is a finite union of affine varieties and then 4 uh, by uh, 2 and uh, 3 uh, any quasi projective variety is a finite union of open subsets. Each isomorphic to an affine variety and the upshot of all this is uh, the theorem that any variety whether it is uh, projective or quasi projective or affine or quasi affine is a finite union of open subsets each isomorphic to an affine variety. So uh, sometimes we say this uh, 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 also in the following way we say that any variety uh, admits a finite cover by op open affine varieties okay that is uh, one way of saying it the other way of saying it is that affine varieties are the building blocks of, of all varieties okay. So, uh, so let me write that down. We, we may rephrase the above as <coughs> number one any variety at which a finite cover by open affine varieties the other way of saying it is that fine varieties are the building blocks of arbitrary varieties okay. So, I mean the, the importance of this is um, you will see the importance of this uh, in the following sense. Uh, so, the first immediate thing is if you are going to study uh, if you are going to focus attention in a neighborhood of a point of a variety then you could uh, uh, as well uh, look at an affine neighborhood of the point and reduce your question to studying uh, a point on an affine variety that is an advantage 
okay. So let me repeat that if you have a variety and you want to study uh, in a neighborhood of the point the variety then what you do is you choose a neighborhood which is an open set which itself is an affine variety okay. The variety you started with may not be affine it could be projective it could be quasi projective okay uh, you know, it could even be quasi affine but then uh, if you want to restrict attention to a point you can you can find an open neighborhood which is itself isomorphic to an affine variety and then there, thereafter it reduces to studying a point on an affine variety okay. So the advantage is that if you are trying to restrict attention to a point or a neighborhood of a point on a variety is just enough to study points on affine varieties okay that is one advantage. The other advantage is, is rather philosophical it is that uh, when you uh, it is it, it concerns the more general definition of what is called a scheme which you will see in a second course in algebraic geometry. So uh, the, the roughly a scheme is uh, something that locally uh, uh, looks that is locally isomorphic to something which is affine okay. So the, the affines they build up uh, uh, what is called a scheme alright. So you can uh, so roughly speaking uh, uh, here you know if you take an affine variety you have its coordinate ring okay and then from the coordinate ring how can you get back the uh, affine variety by applying max spec okay. So you can say any variety is a uh, uh, is, uh, is got by topologically at least as topological space it is got by gluing max specs okay alright. If you take a variety which is uh, which is uh, covered by finitely many affine varieties okay then uh, it is the same as saying that you are gluing all these affine varieties together to get that big variety okay but then each affine variety is a max spec of its coordinate ring. So you can say that this big variety is gotten by gluing the maximum maximal spectra of these uh, various affine coordinate rings okay and more generally the most more, more general thing is uh, what is called a scheme and that is an object that you get by gluing uh, just not maximal spectra but just prime spectra of uh, rings okay. So this is helpful uh, this will be helpful later when you take a second course in algebraic geometry but I am saying that, that the philosophy is already here that affines are the building blocks okay alright. So that is a very important thing now you know there is one fact that I uh, uh, I need to prove I need to tell you that uh, the only regular functions on a on a projective variety are the constants okay but for that I need I need to uh, 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 understand what is happening at a point okay in the neighborhood of a point and I also need to keep track of information of what is happen, happening on an open set okay. So I have to study regular functions uh, in the neighborhood of a point and also regular functions uh, on open sets and uh, uh, the devices that handle these things are respectively called the local ring at a point and the function field or field of meromorphic or rational functions okay which is what I am going to introduce next okay. So, uh, so what I am going to do next is uh, focusing attention at a point this focusing attention at a point uh, so uh, well geometrically uh, uh, study uh, functions close to a point and uh, al algebraically commutative algebraically this is the same as studying local rings okay. So uh, so you know uh, one important uh, uh, distinction between uh, algebra and analysis is that in analysis uh, you have the limit concept okay so you have a limit and therefore uh, uh, it helps you for example to uh, take a small neighborhood about a point and you, you can take smaller and smaller neighborhoods 
and using that you can define various things existence of a limit and then you can define continuity differentiability and you can do analysis. But in algebra uh, uh, a handicap is that you do not have any such uh, notion of limit uh, a priori. Uh, so, so it, uh, it appears that you cannot do uh, uh, for example study smaller and smaller neighbourhoods of a point. So, it appears like that because to study smaller and smaller neighbourhoods of a point I need uh, I need smaller and smaller neighbourhoods first but then the uh, neighbourhoods if they are open neighbourhoods they are Zariski open neighbourhoods and Zariski open sets are you know irreducible and dense so they are huge sets ok. So, you cannot think of uh, epsilon neighbourhoods as you would think of in uh, usual analysis. So, it appears that it is not possible to do that kind of uh, analytic study at a point, but the answer is wrong that is not true. The truth is that you can even though you do not have uh, small enough neighbourhoods the information is still available ok and that is uh, uh, that comes uh, by studying the so called local rings ok. So, if you recall a local ring in competitive algebra is a ring which uh, has a unique maximal ideal ok and uh, uh, so in other words uh, if you take its maximal spectrum it is just a single term ok and uh, uh, and every every element outside that maximal ideal will be a unit ok and you know conversely any any ring with an ideal with the property that uh, every element outside that ideal is a unit has to be a local ring with that ideal as a unique maximal ideal ok. So, uh, these local rings are what we need to study uh, infinitesimal neighbourhoods around a point ok. Uh, and we do it even though we do not have uh, small neighbourhoods Sarisky neighbourhoods even though we do not have the notion of limit ok. So, uh, so let me explain so what we will do is uh, uh, so the so the idea is that uh, in in algebraic geometry whenever you want to study something close to a point you have to always think of think in terms of local rings ok. So, what I am going to do now is I am going to define the local ring at a point of a variety ok. So, uh, the local ring O x p is the notation of a point uh, at a point uh, so I maybe I will use ok at a point p in the right. So, here of course x is a variety. So, we, we are going to define this and uh, how does one define it uh, it is defined in a it is defined in a way in which which extends to defining a uh, local ring of functions of any type uh, you can use this to define uh, local rings of continuous functions local rings of differentiable functions local ring of if you want holomorphic functions and so on and so forth. So, the philosophy is very very general. So, what you do is that uh, so, you uh, so, you do the following thing define uh, O x p tilde to be the set of all pairs u comma f such that u uh, inside x is open x is a point of u and f is a regular function on u. So, you you look at pairs like this ok. So, what I am doing is I am just looking at regular functions defined on open neighbourhoods uh, containing uh, oh yeah ok my point was uh, not small x but was capital it was capital P. So, I will change it thank you for pointing that out I have taken my point as capital P right. So, so you are you are just looking at pairs consisting of a regular function defined on an open neighbourhood of the point p alright. And what we will do with this is that we will introduce an equivalence relation ok. So, uh, uh, define uh, u f uh, equivalent to v g if there exists w open in uh, u 
intersection V such that f restricted to w is equal to g restricted to w okay. So you uh, you put this condition you you define two such two such pairs to be equivalent if they define the same function in a smaller neighborhood of p okay. Of course you know uh, uh, this this implies that uh, if this is true this implies that f and f restricted to u intersection v itself will be equal to g restricted to u intersection v. Okay, this will happen because you know f and g will now be regular function. F restricted to u, rest, f restricted to u intersection v and g restricted to u intersection v will be two regular functions on u intersection v, which is a variety. Okay, and uh, if they are equal on, uh, 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 if they are equal on a, uh, if, if they are equal on non-empty open set, then they have to be globally equal. I only have to ensure that u intersection v itself is reducible. Okay, and I think that's all right because u intersection v is an open subset of u and u is irreducible and therefore u intersection v is also irreducible okay. So uh, uh, so these are two regular functions on u intersection v which coincide on an open subset of u intersection v therefore they coincide everywhere. So uh, well uh, though the equivalence only requires f and g to coincide on a uh, small neighborhood uh, containing of course I, I want uh, uh, I want p to be a point of w that is very important okay probably I do not even need that I mean if uh, it should not create any problems yeah probably I, I do not need this I do not need this but anyway I will add it okay uh, yeah so this is an equivalence relation all right and uh, now you define OXP to be uh, uh, so uh, check this is an equivalence relation. that is very trivial because uh, obviously it is uh, it is obviously uh, reflexive symmetric and for transitivity uh, as far as transitivity uh, that is also quite obvious okay. So uh, this is certainly an equivalence relation. Um, maybe I have to think for a moment about uh, if yeah so the, the point that uh, when one thinks with respect to the usual topology one can be misled one should remember that in the Zariski topology any two non-empty open sets will intersect that is something that one should not forget. So it can't, you cannot have you cannot have you cannot imagine a picture where you have three uh, successive open disks the first and second intersecting the second and third intersecting but the first and third not intersecting that kind of a picture will never happen any two open sets will intersect any two non empty open sets will intersect in the Zariski topology okay. So that is something that you have to remember so we take OXP to be the set of equivalence classes which is just OXP tilde modulo is equivalence uh, set of equivalence classes. And uh, you have this, so you know you have this natural quotient map OXP tilde to OXP uh, and uh, this is pi p if you want okay and this is this sends, uh, this sends an element u comma f here to its equivalence class which I will put a, which I will signify by putting a square bracket this is the map. Now what I want to tell you is that I want to tell you that uh, I, the, the two things I want to tell you first thing is that uh, uh, there, there is a name for these equivalence classes they are called germs of regular functions okay. So uh, uh, equivalence classes classes are called germs 
of regular functions at p okay so a germ of a regular function is represented by uh, on some neighborhood of the point is represented by a regular function okay and it's also represented by another uh, regular function on another neighborhood of the point if uh, if it is also represented by another uh, regular function on another neighborhood then these two functions coincide on the intersection okay so uh, so you know in some sense you you must think of uh, the z equivalence class as defining a particular uh, class uh, of of uh, regular functions at that point so this makes sense as thinking of a function class of functions at a point right and two diff two distinct classes means that they are they correspond to regular functions at that point which will not uh, coincide on any neighborhood of the point okay because if two re if if you have two regular functions locally redefined at the point and if they coincide in some neighborhood of the point then they will give rise to the same germ so if you take two distinct germs they will correspond to regular functions which do not coincide in any neighborhood of that point that's what it means okay so so the moral of the story is that if you want to think of regular functions at a point and you want to distinguish them this is the way to do it okay uh, so that's the first point the second point is that this is a local ring okay that's the point uh, 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 and more importantly you can do this whole construction not only in algebraic geometry you can do this in uh, with respect to anything so for example you could have started uh, uh, i mean you could be working on a on a topological space and you could just take you could fix a point p on the topological space and you could simply consider pairs where you have a neighborhood of the point and you have a function which is continuous real valued or complex valued function okay and then you could add more conditions like you could make that function not just continuous you can make it differentiable if you want you can make it uh, if it is complex valued you can make it holomorphic or analytic and you can put the same definition okay and uh, uh, you will see that again you will always land in a local ring so this definition this 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 uh, this whole process of identifying uh, equivalence classes of functions which agree in a neighborhood of a point automatically produces a local ring so so in so in a nice way you know this is how uh, a local ring which is completely uh, an algebraic uh, concept okay it comes out completely out of geometry okay if you restrict the if you if you if you want to you know uh, restrict your the study of functions good functions at a point you automatically end up with a local ring okay so if i take my space to be uh, an interval on the real line closed interval on the real line and if i take my functions to be real valued continuous functions then i'll i'll get a uh, i'll get uh, a local ring uh, which corresponds to germs of real valued continuous functions okay or i could have taken the space to be the plane or some n dimensional euclidean space and i could have taken functions f which are uh, defined on neighborhood of a point and which are c infinity which means which are infinitely differentiable okay and then i will get the local ring of uh, uh, yeah, i'll get the local ring of germs of differentiable functions c infinity functions and that's what you get when you look at a manifold okay and on the other hand i could also take an x to be uh, a, 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 a domain in the complex plane or a domain in cn n dimensional complex space okay and i could have taken f to be uh, the, i could take the functions to be holomorphic functions holomorphic in several variables okay which means which is equivalent to saying holomorphic in each variable separately okay then i will end up with again a local ring namely i'll get the local ring of holo germs of holomorphic functions at that point so this method of producing local rings is uh, is completely uh, geometric okay so uh, this algebraic concept of local ring comes out through geometry in this way by restricting uh, by trying to look at functions at a at a point okay now uh, the the fact i want to say is that uh, this is actually a ring why this is a ring is because uh, you can define addition and multiplication uh, in fact it's not just a ring in our case it's actually a k algebra uh, it's it's a k algebra and uh, so let me let me 
write out a fact uh, uh, OXP is a local is a is a local k algebra. This is the fact. So, uh, so first of all, how do you make it into a ring? How do you define addition, multiplication, and so on? So, uh, you you define uh, so the operations. So you know if you give me u comma f, and if I want to add it to v comma g, this is the germ of u comma f. This is the germ of v comma g. Okay, mind you, u and v are neighborhoods of the point P. Therefore, u intersection v makes sense. That is also a neighborhood of the point P. So I will simply define this to be u intersection v uh, and f restricted to u intersection v, which is the same as uh, 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 plus g restricted to u, uh, u intersection v. So this is how I ad define addition. Then uh, I can define multiplication in the same way. I simply restrict and multiply on the intersection okay. So uh, you can check that uh, since I am defining these operations on equivalence classes you can check that they are well defined okay. So, uh, so this is my addition, this is my multiplication and uh, of course uh, uh, the uh, make this into a ring, into a ring uh, which is commutative it is of course a commutative ring because uh, the the way uh, the product of functions is commutative okay uh, the function defined by f times g is the same as function defined by g times f okay because uh, functions are defined product functions and some functions are defined point wise and therefore uh, everything is point wise being done in the base field and uh, the base field is of course commutative and uh, so this this makes it into a ring which is a commutative ring with uh, unit element with 0 element the 0 element is very simple it is just the class of x comma 0. So you have the constant functions are always there. So you take the function 0 on the whole of x that is a regular function and you take its germ that is the 0 element and, uh, and uh, unit element uh, is given by x comma 1 to take the constant function 1 constant functions are of course regular functions always so that is the reason why the uh, the constants uh, k the field base field sits in as constant functions uh, in the uh, in the ring of regular functions on any open set so every if you take u any open set then ou is of course a k algebra because k sits inside ou as a constant functions okay so uh, so this makes it into a, uh, a commutative ring with uh, this as 0 element and this as unit element and uh, uh, further it is a local ring uh, why because uh, the, the subset uh, MP uh, uh, M of P so let me write uh, MXP to be the set of all uh, uh, germs u comma f such that f vanishes at p okay so you whenever you take a germ it's defined uh, it re is represented by a regular function on a neighborhood and you take all those uh, take the subset which corresponds to functions which vanish at that point okay then this this is a maximal this is this is an ideal in uh, in OXP that is very clear uh, because if a function vanishes at a point then a function multiplied by any other function will also vanish at that point and sum of two functions vanishing at a point will also vanish at a point so it is an ideal alright and every element which is outside that 
uh, you take a function, uh, you take a germ of germ which corresponds to a function, it does not vanish at a point, it will have a <coughs> it will have an inverse because the moment f does not vanish at p, then <coughs> by continuity f will not vanish in a neighborhood of p, okay. On that neighborhood, 1 by f will be a regular function and f into 1 by f will be 1 on that neighborhood. Therefore, every element outside this ideal is going to be unit and that will tell you that uh, this has to be the unique maximal ideal for that local ring uh, and that ring will be local with this unique maximal ideal. So, let me write that any element outside mxp is of the form p comma g with g of p <coughs> not equal to 0 since g is continuous g does not vanish in an open neighborhood uh, w of p and clearly 1 by g belongs to OW with uh, W 1 by g germ of this into uh, V comma g is equal to x comma 1. So, uh, every element outside mxp is a unit in that is an invertible element in this ring which implies that oxp is a local ring with unique maximal ideal. mxp okay so uh, so this is a local ring at a point of of a, of a of a variety okay and uh, uh, the uh, so the there are so immediately there are a couple of facts about uh, about this uh, so the, the the questions that you will ask is uh, we have defined this local ring <coughs> just using regular functions in a very uh, abstract way uh, can you really write it down commutative algebraically and uh, the answer is yes you can write it down uh, if you are looking at a point on an affine variety okay uh, you can write it down as the localization of the affine coordinate ring at the maximal ideal that corresponds to that point okay and uh, that's one fact the, the other fact is that the local ring will not change if instead of x you take an open subset which can which contains the point p inside x. So, uh, instead of uh, instead of computing the local ring of x at p if I can compute the local ring of, at of uh, u at p where u is an open subset of x which contains the point p I will still get the same local ring which means that you know uh, you uh, inst the local ring depends only on the neighborhood of p on a neighborhood of p it does not depend on the ambient uh, uh, variety okay. So, so the moral of the story is that if you want to really work with the local ring at a point of a variety you know already that uh, uh, that point can be surrounded by an affine open because I have told you that any variety can be covered by finitely many affine opens and uh, therefore the local ring of, uh, of the variety at that point is the same as the local ring of the open affine sub variety at that point but then when you look at the local ring of an affine variety at a point there is a precise al commutative algebraic expression namely it is the localization of the affine coordinate ring at the maximal ideal corresponding to that point. So, this all this helps us to uh, reduce study of local properties to uh, study of local rings of affine coordinate rings okay. So, that is the importance. So, with that I will stop uh, stop now.